Um, George may not remember, but uh, I think the last time we were in contact was a very long time ago over lifelong health and um, what, what was envisaged as a much bigger project has just become the 29,000 or so lives of the victims of Nazi medical experiments. Well, in working my way towards that, there were various references in archives concerning the Nuremberg doctor's trial to a Hugh Iltis and a Hugo Iltis. And so being me, I contacted Hugo Iltis, um, whom I knew very little, of, sorry, Hugh Iltis I contacted um, and um, um, to clarify who did what and why they were both writing about the crimes of Nazi race theorists. That um, was a contributing factor towards this book on race genetics and science published by the Masaryk University Press, which where Hugo, where some essays against race is, um, against Nazi race theory are, are translated. So I'd warmly recommend this very neat little, um, very neat little book. Um, the reason why Hugo Iltis is relevant, it's because he is the author of the first substantial biography of Gregor Mendel. And um, he was actually quite innovative in his, the way he approached Gregor Mendel. He looked at the manuscripts from the time. He did a lot of oral history, interviewing people who knew Mendel in Brunn, and he collected the material history of um, Mendelian research. Um, even eventually establishing a small Mendel Museum. So he contributed a great deal to the, um, to the commemoration of, of, and, of, and of, of the basic historicizing of Mendel. But this biography incensed um, different groups in Brunn. Um, one were the Catholics and the, uh, and the other were German nationalists um, who both felt very deeply offended by this, 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 this um, account of Mendel. Um, in the very, very large document collection of documentation on Mendel, uh, it's really fascinating. And um, as a result of my, uh, there are, for example, this is the, um, the Men this is a hundred years ago. This is what the Mendel celebrations of a hundred years ago looked like. Um, and one can even see what they did for a sort of relaxation, which was to have a double opera program of the master singers of Nuremberg. Well, that's the German side of Mendel and the Bartered Bride. That's the Czech side and that's to keep the Czechs quiet. Although when I actually asked Hugh uh, what he thought, I said, well, is Mendel who had some knowledge of Czech uh, is he Czech? Is he German? Oh, um, Hugh said definitely German. So, uh, so we, uh, but I think German in a very progressive sense. Um, he continued to um, to develop his historical account of Mendel. This is an account before the Mendel statue, which is still in the monastery grounds, and um, again presenting Mendel in a way which was socialist on an evolutionary basis, it's secular, um, and it's just at the turning point in 1929 as um, Hugo Iltis is, bec is becoming a strong anti-Nazi um, while retaining his eugenics. But what's interesting is also from the documentation in this archive, um, which is in the University of Wisconsin library, where it ended up, um, is that you can see the predominance of the Aust Austria-Hungary, and this is in 1910, 44 subscribers, Germans 37, from Britain only 12, United States only eight. So we can see minority interest in a range of English-speaking countries. There really wasn't very much interest in such an entity as a translation, you could say. Um, looking at the um, family um, across generations, we can see Hugo and his wife, Annie, uh, beavering away. And uh, we can see their two sons, whom I'll refer to, 
Fred and Hugh, as, as they became, but still in Brun before the family fled in 1939 from, from the Germans, which is very, uh, very dramatic episode. And uh, he, actually lucky that um, Hugo wasn't, wasn't murdered by the Nazis. One can certainly um, say that. Uh, Fred became an epidemiologist and an entomologist, strongly socialist, and emphasizing that in when his father died. And Hugh became a pioneering ecological um, botanist at Wisconsin University. Hugh having a stellar career, Fred, because of his political um, um, beliefs, um, became a very marginal position at, um, at, San, at the State University of San Jose. Um, what one can also say, what I can also say, is that visiting Fred was nearly the, my end because Fred at one stage took a club used for guerrilla warfare in the jungles against the Japanese and showed and demonstrated to me how Japanese soldiers were executed. And as he bent me over and grasped my neck, I thought my, my end has come. So if you're doing oral history as I always do, and I always visit people when they're, when they're still around, it has its dangers. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but I also saw a suitcase full of wonderful diaries um, stretching over um, 40 years of, um, of, of, of Hugo Iltis. Um, and these are the diaries which are in the University of Wisconsin. Um, what one can see is this strong socialist linkages of and we see this in um, some autobiographical writings um, when he's writing about his, um, when Hugo's writing, when there is the links to the vivarium in Vienna, to Camera, who was a socialist Lamarckian zoologist. Um, if anyone's ever read the case of the midwife Toad, um, that um, by, by Arthur Kostler. Um, uh, 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 it's an important book and certainly Hugo Iltis had a lot of evidence on that issue of the, uh, which led to camera suicide. And we can see here books on rejuvenation, dedication by camera to Hugo Iltis. So a very, very close link to, the, um, to these socialist zoologists, in fact, in Vienna. But what, can, what we can also see is that um, Hugo Eltis was in touch with a wide range of German scientists here at the Fifth International Congress for Erbungswissenschaft, loosely genetics in 1927. Um, we can see a contact here with Erwin Bauer. Erwin Bauer is known for the Bauer Fischer Lenz Handbook on Human Heredity, very nationally minded um, um, botanist. Um, and um, we can, um, so that um, there's a, uh, how can I say, strongly in touch with what is going on in, in German hereditary research. And um, this is further, if I skip that one to this slide, which shows the other side of Hugo Eltis, which is giving public lectures on science. And he crisscrossed um, the Czechos Czechoslovakia at that time, spending days doing complicated, involved lecture tours. Um, in, and uh, this became increasingly difficult because the Germ as the German Czechoslovaks became increasingly nationalistic with the idea of a Sudetenland. Um, these, these socialist biological lectures were increasingly, um, were an increasing problem. Uh, and we can see here um, this idea of the Masaryk uh, Volkshochschule, um, today in a university, but at that time was an adult ed education college, and the sort of writings which um, Hugo Eltis was producing on um, science and socialism. And in this vein, he produced, I think this is probably one of his first ac accounts on 
against racial theory, which he sent interestingly to the anthropologist in the US anthropologist Franz Boas in Colombia in 1930. Um, so Iltis was really pioneering against, against the racialization of um, hereditary biology. And uh, what Iltis was first of all arguing was um, that um, there's a type of, he uses the word, pseudoscientific racism, uh, which derives from uh, the, French the, the, the French writer on, um, on, on race, Arthur Gobineau and Houston Stuart Chamberlain. And he's strongly critical of these, um, of, 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 of this abuse of, um, by, of, 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 of I'd say, firmly grounded biology. Um, at the same time, he got a leading role in the um, socialist um, doctors of the Czechoslovak Republic um, uh, and um, encouraging meetings and generally encouraging opposition to uh, the racialization of biology and medicine. He rejects ideas of a master race and of any inferior race. He rejects ideas of racial purity. And there's a favored theorist of the, a Nordic, of the Nordic race in Germany, Hans Gunther. And um, he is um, Iltis's special target, especially when Gunther became professor at the Nazified University of Jena in 1930. And that's one typical booklet of his. The great challenge of Iltis's writings are he uses pseudonyms. So Wolf Bodansky writing on racism, a um, geistiges giftgas, a um, poison gas, uh, an intellectual poison gas. That is, uh, in fact, another, it's another piece of work by Iltis. So less numerous than one might, one might think but um, genuinely pioneering um, and um, plenty, massive number of such of, 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 of these anti-racial lectures in his, in his archives and his diaries showing the um, active lecturing against Nazi racism, despite the German opposition in the Czech, in, 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 in Czechoslovakia and indeed, um, when Hugh Iltis described to me what a big thing it was to move from a German school to a Czech to a Czech to a Czech speaking school because they were beginning to feel so out of place and endangered um, and, and, and threatened, the Czech the Czech school children were told um, you have to welcome you have to welcome um, these 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 two boys because they're our allies. They're against the these German nationalists. So it was for for um, Hugh a question of growing up within within these nationalist um, tensions. Um, and what I think this um, uh, what it adds up to um, that was actually a, a letter to another socialist biologist called Julius Tandler who eventually died in Moscow and was kicked out by the Austrian, the Austro-fascists as they were called. Um, what it leads to is this, I, uh, there was a growth before the Second World War, really from the mid 1930s, attacking racism. And it, there's a whole new vocabulary. Racismus is a new word. Uh, racism is a new word at that time. It was a vocabulary invented in from the mid to late 1930s, um, particularly in France, there is a periodical called Race Racism. Um, Julian Huxley is another leading figure. Um, for example, with the book that was later published as a pelican called We Europeans. Um, there is in, in Czechoslovakia, two person Tolshan, who's a much more of a Lamarckian, and Iltis, who's a geneticist. There's um, an Austrian, Friedrich Hertz, um, later migrated to Britain. Um, his wife was a pediatrician who used to inform, Hertz was a social scientist, 
and he used to inform her husband about what was going on in medicine and eugenics and theories of inheritance. And interestingly, I was a patient of the Hertz's. So the, and uh, Friedrich Hertz is pioneering German social scientist who'd written his first, his first critical works in Vienna already in 1904, really, really early critiques of, of, um, of racial hygiene and eugenics. Um, yeah, he, he, he was still active in this area and I could be a little patient. Um, and in the USA, there's Franz Boas and these conflicting groups, they clashed at international conferences. Um, there's a whole series of conferences, strong Nazi delegations, German delegations, very well organized and uh, being opposed by small groups with Franz Boas being in particular coordinating leading leading figure. So I think the uh, assumption is very much that there was no real opposition to German race theory. I think there is. I think that's, um, I think it's very, and it was a form of prescient opposition, um, trying to pick up uh, political support as best they could but I think in a difficult um, position uh, and vulnerable, vulnerable position with the spread of Nazism. Um, and uh, somebody like Julian Huxley, one can criticize him a lot as a eugenicist. And uh, he says he has a dreadful record on proposing sterilization of the so-called mental defectives. Um, there's a eugenic society film where Huxley says, it would be better if they'd never been born when he shows a family of so-called mental defectives. Um, so that, um, but I think you know, one what one has to say is that people like Huxley, people like Iltis could draw a line. They were eugenicists within certain limitations, but it's important to work out exactly what their eugenics vision was. This is not to, rehabilitate them in any way. It's definitely right as we heard yesterday, but it would be only within strict limits. So that if, for example, we look at um, condemnation of criminal Nazi biology during and after the Second World War, um, somebody like Huxley, he is actually very good at bringing a, at supporting persecuted scientists, for example. And in Il Iltis's case, this idea of a continuous, um, you can say, of continually documenting the this poison gas of racism, as he called it, um, which meant that he wrote to the Nuremberg, to the Czech representation at the Nuremberg, uh, the International Military Tribunal, and then later to the Nuremberg doctor's trial, providing important evidence on German scientists, uh, Eugen Fischer, for example, no, and Fritz Lenz, two, two noted Mendelian researchers, and saying, look, these carry a massive burden of guilt. Um, and there's a group of popular writers who wrapped science and um, who, who wrapped in the cover of science and also uh, the, po the poison to the so-called intelligence, um, so to German intellectuals, and so providing important evidence to the to the Nuremberg tribunals, and so one can see them as um, as in significant but um, significant figures. They weren't, and in um, the other instance with Iltis is his complete rejection of American racism when he came over to the US and was in Virginia. He found, found this is a really <laughs> distressing. <laughs> I've come, I've escaped the Nazis, but here I am in another racist context. So there was an ability, socialist, eugenicist, yes, materialist, uh, that's how he's, that's, they, that's in a way where the biography of Mendel fits in, 
But on the other hand, there are, um, um, he, he took a stand against um, the abuses of, um, of, um, of scientific biology at that time. Thank you.